will be joining us online. Uh, it, it, we are having some uh, interesting weather for November, so um, just keep it safe. You will not be driving uh, on the motorway to get here. <laughs> um, just some housekeeping. We've got toilets out through the front door on your right, after past the elevators, and the emergency exits are on your right, past the elevators, through the stairs, and we would adjourn on the southwest quadrant of Hanmash Square. Uh, country, uh, we acknowledge the traditional lands that we're bidding on uh, of the Ghana people and that they're the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region and um, respect their cultural beliefs and uh, heritage, I believe rather, and uh, any visiting Aboriginal uh, people from South Australia and Australia as a whole. I'm going to start with boring stuff this time around, so learning. <laughs> Uh, usually it's at the end and people have already turned out by then. Um, so a lot of our part Microsoft partners, uh, there is some learning to be done. So you've got your week of the webinars to tune into. So that's lectures for your exam readiness uh, and exam prep sessions. So if you sign up to one of these for uh, exam of interest, uh, just tune into the five uh, sessions. So it's about two hours a day. Uh, you can probably select the appropriate time zone for yourself, but once you do that, you'll get an exam code to take at some point before it expires. Uh, also a reminder that the Ignite 2022 Cloud Schools Challenge will end next Wednesday or Thursday at 2.30 a.m. our time. Uh, again, you'll get a free exam if you complete one of those learning paths. So Ignite happened. Um, a lot of announcements. Apologies in advance. There's going to be a lot of Sachin and Adela showing up in these slides. <laughs> um, but we'll go go first with the Azure space. So premium solid state disk version two is now generally available. Um, this will let you provision a virtual disk up to the size of 64 terabytes. So it'll have 80,000 NIOPS, uh, 1200 megabit throughput. Uh, so some really hefty disks there for your uh, service and app availability. Along with that, you got elastic SAN, so storage access network. Um, this is an end-to-end -end solution that we're seeing that you can either lift and shift or provision new SAN uh, workloads within Azure. Um, so yeah, that kind of hand-in-hand -hand with the premium SSD version 2, you're going to get a, a large amount of uh, <laughs> improvement here. So that's millions of IOPS, um, double-digit gigabit per second and single-digit millisecond latencies. So pretty, pretty intense, um, considering there is quantum computing around the corner as well. Um, Open AI service and Microsoft are now partnered up with the Azure Open AI service. It's in, currently in preview. What does that mean? Um, these are the same guys that worked on the DALI um, natural language image creation software. Um, there's Sachin Dello and Mr. Open AI. And yes, the version two of DALI is coming to this OpenAI service. So you'll see a lot of that um, coming in, particularly for the new app that they're bringing in, the Microsoft Designer. So that's going to tap into the DALI 2, and you'll be able to generate images and other crazy you know, AI generated <laughs> instances. Uh, for Teams, mesh avatars and private preview, note private preview, NDAs. Um, so we're not going to see too much news on that, but essentially that's what they are, a you know, character, caricature there of yourself. Um, particularly useful if you don't want to be showing up on the camera feed, but um, it's tapping into that whole metaverse, virtual reality immersion. So we'll see and hear more about that soon, hopefully. We're getting a new chat experience. So finally, we, get, we can react to messages with other things besides the default five icons. So probably going to see a lot of fire and eggplants and poos. Uh, <laughs> get the old emoticons back, I'll be happy. The new ones though. Yeah. <laughs> but they're animated. They are animated. <laughs> little, little too much dimension there. Yeah. yeah, there's too much shading and it just yeah. looks creepy. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think we're also getting in, in chat uh, video clips and other quality of life improvements along the way as well. I've been asking for teams to be more like TikTok. 
with. Is... We'll get there. Be careful, be careful what you wish for. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Um, yeah, besides that, we're also getting new channel experience, so that's going to hurt some people. Yeah. The compose bar is now moving to the top. Um, you're going to have a few more types of posts you can do. You've got, there, you've got questions and video clips. Um, the other thing you do is pop out a compensation, which has been something sorely missed so far. It's still not quite the same as popping out the entire team, but it's better than you know, not having that feature altogether. Um, a better ping, just from the look of that. So, probably the next year thing, I, I'm not sure. Um, it's going to be Yammerish as well. Yes, that was the other, yeah. yeah. You know, very, Bieber engage, yeah. yes. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's all just going to come into the one app yeah. sooner or later. Um, Teams Premium. Um, <laughs> we have some advanced meetings and webinars. So if that's your thing, you can brand up your registration pages, your lobbies. Got a question? Will there be dedicated bandwidth for premium? I don't know. I, I, I doubt, um, but potentially. <laughs> um, yeah. Teams has always been a weird one for, not weird, but the, the way that they do bandwidth allocation and, and stuff like that is always just cooked by top and then back end Microsoft network. So no matter where you are, you should be hitting your local pop from the media stream point of view. So technically, you should be getting the best, the best service you possibly can. Now, that because that's kind of your your um, entry point into that, and then the back end is with Microsoft Backhaul. Yeah. So um, whether you can, if, I, I, I haven't seen anything. If you could select a specific region where you hosted a webinar in a region to give the best possible or lowest latency. Um, that would be interesting, but I haven't seen anything about that. I think like having having stuff like what you're presenting, like a, a video or whatever, uploaded into the presentation beforehand in OneDrive or whatever, that will cut down that delay or bandwidth use. So eases off the content delivery network for you. Um, but yeah, the as well as that, you get the automated email reminders, SMS reminders, depending on what type of thing it is. So, just tap that one. So yeah, uh, extra meeting and webinar features coming, but at a premium. Uh, Cisco is now finally a certified Teams device um, partner. So that's been a long time coming. So you're going to see some familiar, or I'm not familiar with them, but some Cisco devices coming in use uh, alongside various other partners um, for your team's room solutions. That's kind of handy for, like, for us, as in where I work. We've got a lot of Cisco WebEx stuff, as in that, that's the, the one we need to fit out of the office, it's all Cisco kit, um, which we don't use WebEx at all, really. It's kind of Teams. So mm -hmm. it's kind of handy now that we can turn those into Teams rooms with the select ones where the existing hardware is Teams compatible soon. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, I, I, I I'd be interested to see what their you know, fit out looks like in comparison to something like a Poly or a, um, mm. the other ones. But Cisco's kit's usually been pretty good hardware wise. So, mm. But it's still, yeah. these nice ones sitting in the corner somewhere, <laughs> they might, might struggle to yeah. do those. I mean, it might just be a, a more new, later yeah. model. So the older yeah. ones that you may have to refresh soon for these ones, if yeah. you're still hanging on to Cisco as a yeah. product. Uh, so places, um, so as that quote over there says, place comes into existence when humans give meaning to a part of the larger undifferentiated space. Um, very vague <laughs> reference there, but essentially we're getting an opportunity to go and specify our working times, places, if we're working from home, if we're in the office, if we're day off, whatever. Um, it looks like that's going to tie into the actual workplace itself. So then you do get to have these shared spaces or hot desks, and then you can kind of specify who's going to be you know, taking up that space. And I don't know, like, I, I, it, it does sound like a use case for some places that have got these environments. So kind of have to see what happens next year when that does come there's, out. There's a few third parties that do this already mm -hmm. for, for hot desk bookings and stuff like that. So it's interesting to see how this would be and also how it integrates into things like VB Insights, for, mm -hmm. like we saw before, where it's like showing where you're going to be working. So I'd love to see it coming through as like 
my daily VB Insights email, you know, where are you going to be working today type of thing and look, pre-book, maybe work in the office or remote or wherever and then, you know, Mm. Potentially, then book a book a desk to go with it, or something like that. Like that's shown. So it'd be yeah. interesting to see how that kind of mm. plays they, out. They are adding like that feature in Teams as well, mm. where you can set where yeah. you are. Um, yeah, things to come. Um, more info later. I'll send out the links after the session. Uh, employee experience. We have been talking about. Viva or Yammer. Um, so the storyline uh, <laughs> part of Engage is rolling out. Uh, should complete by next year. So, like I said, be careful what we wish for. <laughs> you get a social media experience. So, as uh, videos, posts, images, and stuff like that, we'll have a kind of a you know, storyline layout, as you would see in most social media at the moment. Um, I think they did it on LinkedIn, and they kind of yeah took it away and brought it back. Yeah. So, <laughs> looks like it's not going anywhere too soon. Uh, Viva goals, so we're getting integration with Slack, Google Sheets, uh, some on-prem Jira instances, and it's also coming, well, integrations are coming with Microsoft Planner and Microsoft Project down the line. And Microsoft Syntax, they announced it. I thought it was already announced, but it's, yeah, it's, it's been in preview for a very long time. Uh, I think they announced it first in 2017, 18, um, when Cortex was, a, was announced then, so it's all set of uh, apps that will sort out and search through your content and your documents for you, and then you'll be able to automatically generate processes and... Um, Rough pricing? Ooh. <laughs> um, I think at least a price. Well, there is. I think it's about, he can correct me, I think it's about $4 per user per month, US. Okay. So the current stuff behind uh, Power Automate, so if you want to do like PDF searching and text extraction. It's got like a minimum instance of 500 a month. Don't know if it will interact with that. Um, yeah, we'll have to do but it. This could be an alternate for that. Is it what? Sorry. This could be an alternative for that. Um, it could be more powerful because uh, there's also the other topics, which also does. And your document searching for common terms and things like that. Okay. So this, this sounds more useful. This is probably like, yeah, a little more robust than that is. Um, yeah, I don't know, I didn't really have any notes in it, but it's going to let you index and organize large quantities of unstructured data. So if that is your thing, <laughs> uh, yeah, so automatic classifications, um, records and document lifecycle management, stuff like that. So it's just more of the same, but better. Uh, the Loop app, so Microsoft Loop, private preview at the moment. Um, yet another <laughs> app to help you collaborate. Um, uh, you would have seen the Loop components already in Teams. Some some of them are showing up in Outlook for the web. Uh, word, word Online is also getting components, but <coughs> this app will include the pages and workspaces from looks of it. Um, I don't know if you had any chance to play with it. Loop just confuses me at the moment. Not not because of, it's it's confusing. It's because I haven't had any time to spend mm. and sit down. And the only things I've seen are in you know the the uh, the new Outlook um, version and also yep. Teams, where it's just kind of putting in bullet points for me, and I can just do that in the text editor. Yeah. So <laughs> that's yeah, the that extent is. of my work. Um, is the same to time management, um, uh, interest management, it's just or is it idea system. management? I don't know, it's more it's bringing probably together the things. Yeah. From memory, Luke was kind of the thing that was supposed to bring all of those collaboration pieces together, like like the kind of calendaring, timelining, noting, you know, all that sort of stuff into um, one sort of, well, loop. So you bring everyone into the loop. Um, so it's, that's, I think that's where they're trying to go with it. I'm interested to see what they do with it. So I haven't had a look at the, the, the page on it yet. So as in the, the actual web page, which they've just yeah. kind of brought out. But yeah, well, as long as they make it clear what it's used for and, and when, not when, to, well, I guess when to use it as well. I think it's got potential. It's, if you're pulling, if it's easy to pull data in from multiple sources across that M365 ecosystem mm -hmm. to get a nice, clean collaboration space, um, that'd be great. But then 
that's kind of what we got teams for as well. So yes, so, interested to see how this yeah. fits in. If it's just a side app or yeah. have to see what happens there. Um, it is nice to have just the one place to be. So you don't have to leave the context of this to get to like dynamics or outlook or whatever. It's just yeah. in one place. Um, if you are interested, um, check out the Microsoft Loop user group uh, run by Daryl Webster, um, a Microsoft MVP in New Zealand. Um, so yeah, you can check that out um, in the links afterwards um, and join the user group if you wish to. Um, new Microsoft 365 app. So the familiar red orangey O square is now a, I don't even know what that is, hexa Sorry, hexagon a loop. A hexagonal <laughs> loop. <laughs> so they're going with the uh, the new color theme and it's you know, funky. I've had to up update my logo, which I just got branded not that long ago. So yeah, good times. Uh, <laughs> part of this, you get a little little sneak peek at the Microsoft Designer. So it is, it's a D, but it's a paintbrush, I think. Yeah, and ink spilling everywhere. Uh, the other thing that you may notice on there is ClipChamp. So Microsoft acquired that not too long ago, but it's a video editing tool. So it should show up in your list of apps in 365. Um, not really an ex experience thing, but I guess it can be. So you're going to be able to create flows and power automate with natural language. So literally typing in what you want it to do and it's going to put together something. So um, good to see where that's going. Um, I wouldn't mind trying it out. So you could cut down some time in generating uh, flows for your power automate. I believe the same thing's happening across our apps, maybe. And there is a GitHub Copilot. So there's, there's AI assistance in there as well. So path we're going down at the moment. Uh, security, thanks. Um, you can see where we're leading with this. Um, so Microsoft Defender for Cloud is getting a couple of new things. So there's Defender for DevOps now. So you'll be able to have visibility and centrally manage uh, all your DevOps environments in one place. That's uh, skipping code yeah. preview as well. That's just going <laughs> straight to GA because it's actually just the GitHub <clears throat> security, enterprise security that they've kind of taken from GitHub as part of the purchase. And they're just moving it, not moving it, moving it, but kind of placing it into Defender. So it's skipping preview altogether because it's been around for so long. They're just. Oh, it's, Re renaming an existing thing and just putting it under the Defender for Cloud banner. Um, but yeah, it's looking good. We just did an ADO deployment, so I'm sort of in the thick of looking at that at the moment. It's quite good. It's just a toggle switch and start paying per month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> They're good for that. I yeah. just need to figure out what it takes to get it to live for me. So. <laughs> um, another thing coming is Cloud Security Posture Management. Um, so this one's in preview. <laughs> uh, it's going to have insights across everything, pretty much in your cloud resources, um, including DevOps um, Defender there. Uh, it's going to provide contextual risk-based uh, information for your security operations teams. Um, yeah, well, uh, similar, similar to what it's already been doing for Windows. So there's a cloud security posture management um, sort of which is part of Defender the Server. And this is just expanding that out to be more than just Defender for Server. So it'll do any other MVC components like Defender for Cloud, Defender for Kubernetes, and the other parts of the, the other bits of Defender for Cloud. And that's that's where it's going to get really interesting. So we'll follow up a little bit into some really good um, posture management dashboard and, and availability to consume all of it and then be able to schedule and do all your remediations as well. Like you'll still have to do them, but yeah, it tells you what you can do. I missed that text really quickly, but apparently uh, Microsoft 365 Defender is now going to be able to automatically disrupt ransomware attacks or forms of attacks. Um, Microsoft Defender Endpoint is 50% off from now until the end of June next year. So if you've not got plan one on plan two at the moment, not on dip, yeah, business premium 365, then uh, you can sign up for that. Um, it's not bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you did have uh, Microsoft 365 business premium, you'd have Defender for Business. And if you already had E5, you'd probably already have E2. So uh, for those that don't have it already, um, good chance to try it out. It's also a free trial. 
30 day or 30 to 90 days, one or the other. Uh, yeah, Microsoft Intune, it's getting rebranded back to Microsoft Intune. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we won't probably see Microsoft Endpoint Manager as much, um, but we are getting some extra client solutions and these new ones down here. So remote help and mobile app management and privileged endpoint management as well. I'm maintaining that everyone just refused to call it Endpoint Manager and kept calling it Intune, so they just went screw it. We're just going to keep calling it Intune now. Yeah. That all they, they didn't like them too much. Yeah. <laughs> Um, last but those things, so Windows Hub of a Business Hybrid Cloud Kerberos Trust is now available. It's a lot of words. Uh, <laughs> it's tying in your on-prem single sign-on experience with your MFA and passwordless experience in uh, Azure AD. I don't know if you're covering oh, that. So you are sure cool. Think, so that's yeah, perfect yeah, segue. Yeah. Well done. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got Matt Klein here today to talk to us about the road to passwordless. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a shuffle yeah. here and change machines, so bear with us. Oh, oh it's great. It's going to go I, I should, just, just, should have just grabbed your slides. Um, yeah. Hang on. And to make this even better, I um, <laughs> asked my daughter this morning to put my laptop bag in my car as I was driving her to school, and she kind of didn't do that. So I'm, I'm using the loaner from work. Um, this may go horribly wrong. Um, may go perfectly, but I'm probably going to err on the side of it not going perfectly, but I was working on the slides today, so hopefully everything will just enjoy the meeting. Yeah. Sorry, that was me trying to help you machine connect. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. It's, it's are, you, are you on the network? Because you'll need to be to share that the slides in Teams. Yeah, you'll need right. to be connected. Uh, okay, right. that would definitely help. When, when does that discontinue? What is that? Yeah, I, this is this happened to me today. It was just, um, so what's the password is? And is there a username? No. Uh, sorry, you go back. It's uh, in that code. Uh, okay. Go. I'm surprised it let me on the network considering I was using. Um, uh, Do you want me to send a join request again? No, it's okay. I, I think I've got it in um, uh, in my calendar. I think. <laughs> There we go.
is there any gossip on uh, multi tenancy for teams with SWA? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, no, I haven't heard yet. Um, still, still a pain in the process, which is my Face it's there, it's not quite. I use those profiles to mitigate it. Yeah, but Team Strange just isn't quite as powerful as the rest of the experience. Wait, they didn't announce they were moving to the Edge Web View 2. So, Monday. All right, looking good, Matt. Thanks. Sure. All right. Um... Uh... Because this is going to go. No, 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 no. Let's see if I can completely break the whole thing. See what happens. Is anything working in Teams? Teams is still on the title slide. Seeing your um, slideshow. <laughs> Yay. Maybe, maybe uh, just do the slideshow and share that. Yep. Share that share screen. Oops, wrong screen. Wow. This is going swimmingly. How are we going now? That's it. That's good. All yep. right. So I was going to do a whole heap of Jerry Maguire. You had me at hello. Um, in fact, I had an audio clip in here. The audio clip was so bad I had to take it out. So because I didn't have time to do any audio editing, um, and that is not my um, my forte. <laughs> so Windows Hello for Business. Um, what I'm going to cover today is what is it? Why is it more secure? Why do we need it? Um, how do we get it up and running? Some prereqs, some unsupported situations, and just a bit of a. I'm going to go through what it looks like fairly quickly at the end, not super quick, but um, depending on your situation, like this is going to be obviously very generic into how this goes through it. Um, I'm going to go through the, the two um, implementation methods being um, Intune and GPOs. Um, and I get to use Intune again, um, rather than saying Microsoft Endpoint Manager and actually be technically correct. So, so what is Windows Hello for Business? So Windows Hello for Business provides a new non-password credential for Windows 10 and 11 devices. It implements two-factor or MFA, um, which means a multi-level security that's much more difficult to bypass than protection that hinges solely on correct username and password combinations. The other part to this is that it does make it easier on end users. So because there is a pin and a multi and a um, potentially a biometric being fingerprint or face. Um, when you are implementing complex or longer passwords, it makes it easier from a change management point of view. So if you say to your users, hey, we all need to go to 16 character passwords, but we're putting in Windows Hello for Business, which allows them to have a pin, the pins say six characters. Six characters is a heck of a lot easier to remember and a lot more acceptable by a user base than 16 character passwords, for example. So as I said, um, Hello for Business, it has to have a pin. Then it can link to biometric authentication, um, fingerprint, um, Windows Hello Finger. Hopefully it's not called that. Um, and Windows Hello Face, which it is called that because I checked it in settings because um, that's awful, or a security key. So FIDO2 FIDO um, compliance security keys like YubiKey and stuff like that, you can use them. Um, for your actual auth login, um, like actually logging into the machine, um, just with those um, methods can, with the FIDO keys, can get a little bit janky, especially in Windows 10. So, you know, your mileage may vary on that one, um, but things like fingerprint scanners and um, um, Windows Hello Face um, definitely are fantastic. I've been using the, the face recognition one for ages. In fact, I get annoyed when I when I haven't set up a, a laptop because I actually have to type my password in and my password's deliberately not short, but um, it's quite a, an annoying thing. So what's the problem that we're trying to solve with Windows Hello for Business? Um, so 
strong passwords are hard to remember and um, users basically reuse them across multiple sites. Um, and by the way, I'll make sure that the deck, because I've left the links in here, so I'll make sure that um, we, if anyone wants the deck or anything like that, we can circulate that as well. And I've also got at the very end some of the resources in there with some hyperlinks and stuff like that if you do want to go and learn more. So um, if you're seeing links in here, um, don't don't get too worried because they'll they'll be in there. Um, I just need to, uh, sorry, I'm just moving some stuff around. Um, so server breaches can expose symmetrical password credentials. Um, passwords are subject to replay attacks. So replay attacks occur when an, an attacker copies a stream of a message between two parties and then replays the stream to one or more different parties. So um, it's basically, it's, it's similar to a man in the middle attack. So it's just hijacking the, the, the network stream um, and then replaying it back um, with a modified stream. So um, that's, that's susceptible when you're doing um, passwords. And then users can also inadvertently expose their passwords due to phishing attacks. So we don't know what phishing attacks look like um, as a user, you know, clicks on the wrong link in a, um, an email, pops up with what they think is a, um, an accurate looking logon screen, put their username and password in, and that account's now compromised. And we start looking at lateral movement and all those other fun things that everyone loves to see on their network. And there we go. Okay. Um, so why is it more secure? So how can a four to six digit pin be more secure than a 12 character password? So typically 12 characters is about the standard now um, for the minimum password length. If you ask me, I'd say 16 is usually about my my minimum. Um, just you know, the, the five odd years ago, eight was about the standard, I think was the, the recommendation from Microsoft. Now it's getting up to 12 to 16 is the minimum recommendation from Microsoft for, for passwords <laughs> with complexity. So we're asking users to think of longer, more complicated passwords. And the other thing I was going to put in here, if you if you are feeling going to do some homework, um, have a look at XKCD. There's a really, really good password um, comic from them that explains why um, we've got really, really good at creating passwords that are really easy for computers to guess and horrible for us for, to remember. So the longer they are, the, generally the harder it is um, to remember. But the thing with pins is the pin is tied to a device. It's not tied to anything else. So my pin on this device is universal to just that device. Even if I set the pin the same pin, so say it's one, two, three, four, it's not one, two, three, four. But if you did use something like that or you used something and you used it across multiple devices, it's not actually the same hash and they're not stored the same way. They're not stored centrally um, and it's not transmitted anywhere. So it's stored on the TPM chip um, and I'll go into this um, a little bit later. It for when you when you do set up, say, Windows Hello um, on your personal devices, um, that is slightly different. It does store it in the TPM chip, but it has to be a TPM 2.0 chip. For enterprise stuff, for Windows Hello for Business, which is what we're talking about, it can be a TPM 1.2. So it will allow you to go back a bit um, and you're not quite as restricted on, on your, your hardware. Um, obviously, if you're looking at Windows 11, you're going to have TPM 2.0s across there because you need them for, for your, um, your hardware. Um, it can, the pin can be complex. So it can, you can allow your users to use letters and numbers, and that can be applied through GPO or policy, but be sensible about it. It's not a password. So don't think of it like a password. If you put a, a pin requirement on your users that's 12 and it can be complex, you kind of might as well have given them a password anyway, and they're just going to be as grumpy and they're just going to forget them as much as they, they did before. So you, my take on the pins is this is a easier way for, for for users to be able to log into their device while still having a complex password. So you want to still be using SSO, you want to still be doing all of those things, but with pins, when they you know come back onto their machine, they've, they've gone to a meeting, they've gone to their lunch break or whatever, logging back in is a pin. It's four to six characters or, or numbers, whatever they prefer. It just makes it easier. Um, now, if that pin stored on this device, 
what happens if that device is taken? So the hacker has to either spoof the biometrics, if you've got biometrics um, linked to it, or they have to guess the pin all before the um, TPM chips anti-hammering kicks in. So it's harder. And to give you an analogy, it's like someone looking over your shoulder when you're at the ATM, right? So them having your pin doesn't actually make it any less secure. They have to have your card as well as your pin to be able to link the two together. And again, like your ATM card, that pin is linked to that card. So um, it's similar in those ways. So it is, it is a lot more secure than a standard password. And like I said, it's not transmitted. Um, there is a great video from Microsoft that they did, and they did a deep dive on how pins are um, a lot more secure than passwords. Um, it just, it's kind of one of those things that doesn't sit very well with a lot of, um, a lot of us to begin with, especially in the security community where you go, oh, we're going to go from complex long passwords to tiny little pins. It just feels a bit wrong. So it is more secure than passwords though. So how does it work? Um, Windows Hello credentials are based on certificates or asymmetrical key pairs. So hello credentials can be bound to the device um, and the token that's obtained using the credentials is also bound to the device. So like I said, it's all linked back onto that TPM chip. Um, an identity provider validates the user's identity and maps it to the hello public key. Um, and then the user account during the registration steps. Um, the example providers are AD or um, mm -hmm. AAD or a Microsoft account. So they're the most common ones. Seeing we're at the Microsoft IT thing, probably the ones you're going to be using. Um, the keys can be generated in hardware. So like I said, TPM 1.2 or 2 um, for enterprises and TPM 2 for consumers. So that's if you're logging into your personal Microsoft account on your personal machine, it does have to be a TPM 2 for it to be generated there. Um, or software, and you can base that all off policy. Um, and that guarantees that your keys are getting generated in hardware. So sorry, to guarantee that, you have to set that in policy as well. Um, the authentication is two-factor uh, two authentication with a combination of keys or certificates tied to a device and something that the person knows, a pin, or something that the person is, which is biometrics. Um, Windows Hello Gesture doesn't um, roam with the device and it isn't shared with servers. So like I said, it's very self-contained. Um, this is not something that's transmitted over the wire, so it's not something that can be intercepted. Um, biometrics are stored locally on the device. The pin is never shared or stored. Um, well, it's never stored anywhere but on the device again. So um, we just need to make sure that, again, it's the device that is retaining this information. The private key never leaves the device um, when using the TPM. The authentication server has a public key that's mapped to the user account during the registration process. I'll show you the registration process. Again, I'm not going to go super detailed into it because it's kind of a follow with the bouncing ball part. Um, but yeah, that's that's in there. Um, the pin entry and biometric gestures both trigger Windows 10 and later to use the private key um, to sign the data that's sent to the identity provider. The identity provider, so in this case, either AD or Azure AD, um, verifies the user identity and authenticates the user. So for those personal accounts um, and corporate accounts, um, use a single container for keys. All keys are separated by identity providers' domains to ensure the user's privacy. So that means they're segmented, they're only there for, for your users. Certificate private keys can be protected by Windows Hello Container and the Hello Gesture. So why do I need it? Aren't strong passwords like enough? Well, you could be okay with long passwords. I'm not saying that long passwords aren't needed. You're still going to need complex passwords. And realistically, we should probably be stopping using the word passwords. We should really be trying to transition people into passphrases um, to be able to get that complexity and that length. And you might be okay with it, but how do your users feel about it? So. Currently, where I work, we are about to transition from eight character passwords as the, man, as the minimum to 16 with complexity. This is going to be fun. Um, I also have an interesting definition of fun, but it's, it's not going to be a whole heap of fun for my user base. My password, you possibly saw me flacking it in. Um, I think at the moment it's 26 characters. 
So that's just my standard password, just because I use a passphrase. Um, but I'm pretty sure that most of the user base is just going to take their current password and then add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight at the end of it. That's my expectation. Um, I don't think I'm far off being wrong. I, I'm pretty sure that that's what's going to happen. Now, just to diverge a little bit from the Windows Hello part, there is a complementary side to this, which is um, within Azure AD, and I believe it's a P2 function, there is password protection as well. So it's an agent that sits on your DCs and is also a cloud-based service and will stop your users from using silly passwords like password one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So maybe it's proxy. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, is, is it's that cross-looking? Because we maybe noticed it's looking across users' passwords and detecting multiple instances of similar passwords. Yes, yeah. Um, so yes, it is cross-looking. Um, and that's, that's something that I'm doing more looking at at the moment. Um, it's, the, the, the service also allows you to customize some phrases and will automatically, um, so say, say you, were, you were putting in um, your company name in there. Actually, it already takes your company name out of your, um, your tenant information. But say you wanted to put in your address. So I work out on Green Hill Road. So say one of the words that I wanted in there was Green Hill. Um, it will automatically take that and block it, but it will also take Green Hill with a three Green Hill with a one instead of an I, and you know those kind of combinations as well. So it's a really good service. Highly recommend having a look at it, and if you're licensed for it, it's really quite good. Does it learn some of those patterns, or is it pre-programmed with means speak and other? Uh, it, it's pre-programmed, but I think they're adding probably some AI in the back end for, from some well AI ML in the back end for for some learning modules and algorithms to be able to pick up. You know, an automatic switch of an I will they'll also check for a one or a you know. Um, a pipe and all those sort of stuff. So, um, so the other part of this is the longer your passwords get, the easier it is, the more frequently you're usually doing password um, resets for your users. Um, Gartner estimated that between 20 and 50% of all help test calls are for password resets. One of my first jobs in IT, in fact, I think it was my third job in IT, was working for Telstra in a new help desk that they set up called the Password Reset Center. And it was literally a help desk of at least 20 of us that only did password resets across Telstra nationally. So they found out that's how much passwords were being needing to be reset, and they set up a dedicated um, help desk for that. So here's a demo, hopefully this will work, of, because um, because it's John Savile, that's why it's here. Um, <laughs> um, let's hope that this works. Of him setting up Windows Hello. To configure Windows Hello, the first step is to actually set up a pin. So I'm going to go into settings, go into my accounts, and then my sign in options. Here I just click add for pin, and I type in a pin for this account. This can be a six digit combination or other configurations based on the requirements in your organization. Now the pin is set up, I can now go ahead and configure Windows Hello. This is going to use the 3D features of the camera. So I type in my pin, and now I just have to look at the screen. This is actually capturing not just a picture of my face, but actually the 3D geometry of my face, and it's storing that. So I just stare at this for a little bit of time. It's now going to capture all of this detail. And this can now be used to unlock and log in on my machine and even authenticate for other applications. That's now set up and I'm done. I could improve the recognition or just carry on. It will automatically unlock when it sees my face and I can add extra security by turning my head if I need that. Now, if I just lock the machine, it's now basically going to be looking for me. So here you can see it's looking for me. If I actually put my face in front of the camera, it sees me. I just dismiss the lock screen and I'm logged in. It's literally that simple now and it's encrypting all my credentials locally on the machine. Thank you. The big reason I had to add that was because it's John Savile. And, um, but that's how easy it is. But the key thing to remember here is 
the pin had to be set up first. You can't use biometrics without the pin. It's it's intrinsically done. You don't have to have the biometrics. You have to have the pin um, to start with Windows Hello. So how do you get it running? So this is where we get into a bit more. So as Andrew said, there was a new mode released at Ignite um, called Kerberos, um, Cloud Kerberos Trust. And I'm going to trip over this about 14 different times. They do weird stuff in all their articles around capitalization on this. So this is now, even though it's in preview, this is now the recommended deployment method. The reason why is because it was a bit complicated before with certificates and pairings and other sort of stuff, and you had to cycle those every now and then. So um, unless you have a hard requirement to use certificate-based authentication for your users, use this because it will make your life significantly easier. Um, so Windows Hello for Business Cloud Kerberos Trust uses um, Azure AD Kerberos to address pain points of the key trust deployment methods. So um, Hello for Business Cloud Kerberos Trust. I'm just, you know what? I'm going to skip that part from now on, and we're just going to go part. So. Um, Hello for Business Kerberos um, provides a simpler deployment experience because it doesn't require you to use public key infrastructure or change to changes to your existing PKI. Um, Cloud Kerberos doesn't require syncing of public keys between AAD and um, on-prem DCs um, for users to access their on-prem resources and applications. This means uh, this change means that there isn't a delay between the user provisioning and being able to authenticate. There used to be a there used to be that delay. And it could be, depending on your sync cycles, it was basically off of your AD sync cycle, not based off of your password hash sync cycle. So a password hash sync cycle is automatic, whereas your standard AAD sync cycle would be either 15, 30 minutes or 45, depending on what your cycles are like. Um, deploying um, Hello for Business Kerberos Trust enables you to deploy passwordless security keys with minimal extra setup. One of the things that I'm, I'm actually not going to go into here is how this, this is more going to be more about Windows Hello for business. Passwordless is another just component onto this. It does require you to use the, the authenticator app and there's a few other bits and pieces to it. But once you get this in, this is actually the heavy lifting. Um, then passwordless becomes a lot easier off the back of it. So what are the prerequisites? You have to have multi-factor authentication. Um, you have to have a patched <coughs> uh, Windows 10. Um, so version, sorry, this is the prerequisites for Kerberos Cloud Trust, not just Windows Hello for Business. So for Kerberos Cloud Trust, you have to have a patched Windows 10 21H2 or um, up-to-date Windows 11. Um, so just in case you weren't sick of patching enough, if you want to do this, you've got to patch your stuff more. Um, if you're not up to those most recent ones. Um, there's no difference between um, Azure AD joined and hybrid joined devices, but they still do need to be in Azure AD as devices. Um, you need to have your DCs at 2016, um, and they need to be patched for that um, AAD Kerberos, um, and those are the KB articles that you need to have if you're using 2016 and 2019. Uh, you have to have um, a machine with the AAD Kerberos PowerShell module. You have to have that because you need to register a Azure AD um, uh, in Azure AD Kerberos. You have to register basically a machine account in there, um, which is part of the process of setting this up. It's not complicated. I think it's like two or three commands to set it up. Um, but again, once it's in there and done, it's a set and forget, and it automatically cycles its um, key pairings as well um, as it goes through. Um, so device management, the uh, Cloud Kerberos Trust can be managed with either group policy or through mobile device management. So replace that with Intune. Um, the feature is disabled by default and it has to be enabled using um, policy. I'll go through what you need to do with those policies because you will probably need to refresh your GPO policies because obviously this is a new feature. You're going to need to grab that out of your, your source code, um, not your source code, um, out of your deployment packages and your ISOs for um, Windows 11 or Windows 10 and just update your ADMX files in group policy so that you'll start seeing them. So when can't you use this? Um, you can't use Cloud Kerberos 
for on-prem only deployments, you have to have this obviously as a, a pairing to AAD Connect um, and along with um, AAD. So RDP and VDI um, scenarios using those credentials, um, it won't work yet. Um, I would say that this will probably be coming to Windows 365 first because that seems to be Microsoft's focus. So that will probably come through there first. Um, as I said before, anything that requires you to use certificate authentication, it's not going to work in that situation. So if you are doing anything with certificate based or smart card authentication, it's it's not going to work there. You're going to need to use the old model. Um, using Kerberos Trust for run as. So if you're doing run as and you want to be able to do this in that situation, might be an edge case, but it's not going to work. Um, Signing in with Cloud Kerberos Trust on hybrid Azure AD joined devices without previously signing into a DC. So you have to sign into your DCs first. Um, and then because all the key pairings and all the setting up and all the negotiations have to happen in your local AD first, and then those changes sync back through um, through AAD Connect. But if you're, you're not doing that and doesn't have line of sight to a DC, it's not going to work. <coughs> So if you've already de um, deployed on-premise SSO for passwordless security um, sign-in, um, then you've already deployed um, an AAD. So if you've already done passwordless, the Kerberos component to this you've already done. You don't need to do it again. Um, you don't need to redeploy it. You don't need to change it. It's all there and you can just skip this whole section of everything uh, of, of the, the implementation. Um, if you haven't deployed AD, um, um, Azure AD Kerberos, you need to create um, an Azure AD Kerberos server object, like I said, for the domain where you want to use um, Windows Hello for Business Cloud Kerberos Trust. And it's PowerShell only, and I've got a link to it there as well. But that's why you need those PowerShell modules in there so that you can obviously execute the commands. So what do the policies look like um, in Intune? It can either be a device enrollment policy or a device configuration policy. The device config policy is recommended. The reason why that is, is because the device enrollment policy only applies at the point in time when the device is enrolled. So if you make a change to that policy, the device will only get that change of that policy when you refresh the device. You make a change to the policy and it's part of the device configuration policy, it'll just push it down automatically to it. So um, use the, um, the device configuration policy. Um, then you need to enable Windows Hello for Business. And as I said, um, we need to enable that for, you can either enable it for a targeted set of users or devices, um, or you can skip it and um, just do it for everyone. So um, step one, uh, you sign into MEM. Oh, see, I've left MEM. I'm chopping and changing. Um, so this is, I'm, again, I'm going to skip over this a bit. This is a bit more detailed on, on the actual click-throughs. Um, but you select your profile types. And the, the part of this is that you do need to use a custom template. Um, and you just need to, the, the naming of it isn't that important. Um, but yeah, give it a meaningful name in um, Intune. Um, and then in the configuration settings, you just need to name it, or you need to give it a description. Um, and then those are the actual settings that you need to set in um, Intune. Um, and then, then you start assigning it to your groups of either users or devices. Um, so that does mean that in this particular situation and also with group policy, you can be selective about who you um, roll this out to to begin with. So you can go POC, pilot, closed pilot, open pilot, small deployment, large deployment, you can move it out to business units at a time, however you want to do that implementation and um, have it aligned to your um, change management procedures as well. Um, so, yep, yeah, you can select the users. Um, and then once you're all done, you just create the policy. It's actually a lot easier with GPOs. Um, as I said, you will probably need to update your GPOs from um, Windows 10 21 H2 or Windows 11 if you haven't already done so. I'd recommend moving to a central store for your um, GPOs. If you haven't, there's actually, a, I've, I've dropped a link on there um, just so you can see what central store is. It's just a heck of a lot easier to manage your group policies as well. So um, your GPOs is um, basically you just create a new um, GPO and then 
because of the ADMX file from the, the newer versions of Windows, you can just go through and click back through into your um, admin um, templates in Windows components and turn on the features that you need to um, in there. Uh, and also that last part, optional but recommended, um, use hardware security device. So for, for all of these things, that is the part that requires that to um, have the key pairing generated um, through your TPM chip. So that's recommended. So as we go through provisioning, um, process begins immediately after the user's signed in and the policy is assigned to them. So once they've got the policy and they sign in um, and everything's checked, then um, it moves past into uh, to make sure that the hybrid um, join is in place um, and that the policy and the trust are all aligned. Um, you can also determine the status of your, your prereqs by checking in user device registration in the admin log, or you can do a um, DS reg command um, with a slash status from the command prompt, and that will actually show you the status of the computer for um, hybrid join. Then once that's in there, um, you can set up your pin. So Windows Hello for Business um, provisioning begins, and this is when the user is using basically the out of the box experience. They will actually get the set up your pin now, um, as we showed, as I showed in the, the demo before, which is a slightly older Windows 10 version, but it was still basically the same for users now. Um, this is more the out of the box experience when when users are setting up and logging into the device for the first time. They'll need to set up that pin um, and the processing flow goes through. Now, if they haven't set up MFA, it will prompt them for MFA at that time as well. Um, so once they're successfully MFA'd, um, then it will fail back into not fail back in, but flop over to pin set up as well. So once the user set up their pin, um, it can be used immediately for sign in on um, hybrid join devices. The first time the uh, use of the pin requires communication to the DC. So like we said before, they've got to be not on net. Well, they've got to be either on net or on virtual net. So they've got to have a line of sight to the, the, the domain controller for all those um, communications to be updated back into AD and AD to sync that back through into Azure AD. Um, and then once they've signed in um, or unlocked their PC, those cached logins can be used for subsequent unlocks without line of sight to, or network connectivity to a DC. So once you've done it once, you're good. You can take it off net and um, your cache credentials will work from there. But it needs to be online? Once, once only. So no, it doesn't have to be online because it'll use the TPM um, authentication. It'll do the, the key pairing off that. Um, and that's actually, that's about it. It's not, it, it seems like a lot. Um, the, my recommendation is obviously if you're invested in the Intune side, follow down the, the Intune side. Um, I've found that the GPO side is a lot simpler and a lot easier, ironically, um, just because it's less steps and just generally seems to be, I don't know, maybe I'm just old, um, which is possibly the problem. Um, so there's, that does seem to be the easiest component um, of it. So create your GPOs, um, well set up your, your um, computer object in there um, and um, in um, Azure AD Kerberos and then set up your policies and that's pretty much it. It's actually pretty easy. And once you've done all that, um, then you can start going down the path of passwordless for your users. If you haven't done passwordless yet on your personal Microsoft accounts, um, what it does is it prompts you, what does your normal um, auth pop up be notification? And then on the screen, it will have a number as well. So then in your, your Authenticator app, it'll give you three options. You pick the number and away you go. No more passwords ever. Um, I switched over to passwordless on my personal account a while ago and I wouldn't look back. I think also the fact that you can do it on your, well, for me on my Apple Watch is really, really handy as well. So there's some, some good stuff there. So that's it from me. Any questions? That was a lot. Yeah, so it did require a PKI um, for both on-premises and for syncing back through into um, the service. So you did need to have a PKI set up. And that's where the, this, so the barrier for entry was PKI. 
And that's why Microsoft has gone through with this Cloud Kerberos um, trust, because it is so much easier now to just create this object in um, Azure AD Kerberos, and you don't have to worry about certificates and all the hell that goes with managing certificates, certificate lifecycle management, all the rest of it. So it's a, it's a lot simpler now. How do we get the slides? Uh, let Andrew worry about that. No, well, I'll, um, I'll, we'll figure it out. I'll, um, I'll, I can send them out somehow, or we can send a link to um, a OneDrive location for them. But we'll, we'll find a way. We have the technology. So I think Andrew's just scurried out to, to get pizza as well. Either that or he's going to the bathroom or something. I, I may as well ask this here. I, I don't fully understand the question and I've never formulated a proper answer for it. A uh, cybersecurity professor asked me this. If the system is not dependent on an external, a third party certificate provider in order to authenticate the offer response session and say that's definitely not masquerade, this is not someone who's not Microsoft asking you to go through whatever stage of the hoops you happen to be jumping through. How does it itself protect from the masquerade, aside from the obvious that if there's a device involved, then obviously you are dependent on it being able to present to the device from the machine kind of thing, so there's an obvious announce. So it doesn't matter what you do with security, you're always going to have to take some risk position. Mm -hmm. So where where are you willing to take a risk position? Um, and I think in this particular instance, that's absolutely correct. Without absolute third party verification of absolutely everything you do, mm -hmm. you can't absolutely guarantee it. But as we saw with things like the SolarWinds attack, yeah. that's not always 100% there either. So that's part of my answer. Yeah. Um, so there's no, there's actually no way that you can always be 100% sure that someone is who they say they are. It's again, it's where you're willing to take risk positions. So, or yeah. where's where's your sphere of trust? So if you're if you if you define your sphere of trust as I have a TPM2 module and I trusted my hardware, my, my hardware supply chain, so I know that my hardware coming into me hasn't been corrupted and there's no, you know, anything like that. So security around supply chain and delivery of assets. Um, I'm comfortable with my communications across both my trusted network and across the internet and how things are being transmitted there. Then, you know, there's compromises in each one of those things. Um, and so, yeah, there's no really good answer, but it, it turns into more of a where, where am I willing to wear a risk position? Yep. Are you familiar with how many steps the, the handshake process is now? I can't remember. Um, off the top of my head, it's, in, in, in my own thinking, there are ways to mitigate it during the handshake. Like you reduce the probability of it being a masquerade to plausibly zero kind of thing. But um, yeah, so um, if you look at the auth process for just a standard authentication into Azure AD, um, you would have your passwords initially are stored are hashed on premises in um, on your domain controller. So for um, a, the most common authentication method back into um, Azure AD being password hash synchronization now, which is the Microsoft Mecca recommended way. We're not going to talk about ADFS because that the, the more people get away from that, the better. Um, but there is pass through authentication, which I'll just keep it to hash. So when AAD takes that um, comes into play, what it's doing is it's taking that copy of that hash from your domain controller, it's salting that, and then it's synchronizing the uh, the hashed salt of that to there. So it's not the password, um, which you know. Um, so as part of that, what it does is when you auth back through, you're authing to initially to the Azure AD service. So it checks back through, it does a refer back into the domain controller and then comes back in. So the the, the, the reverse engineering of those things to make sure that the, the hash and the salt all match up and align back through. So that's your password verification. Um, so that that is the basic flow of it now. It's a lot more simplified than 
what it was before, but your token generation is um, is still done with password hash synchronization. Your token generation is issued by Azure AD, not by your on-premises AD, because you're not all thing to that. It's just verifying your passwords stored correctly. Yep. Um, so that's that's removing that as a possible attack vector as well. So if you've got a compromised AD account on premises, it doesn't mean that your AAD account's compromised as well. Um, but yeah, it's um, the the process will depend on what IDPs you're using as well. So if you're using something like an Okta or a Ping, it's going to be different. It's going to be very um, ADFS like, where it's going to do trust referrals and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's um, it is still, I guess, trusted enough for it to be, you know, um, when, when we're talking about Azure AD, I would never say that anything's absolutely immutable, but it's, you know, it's, it's, we've got to trust something at some point. I'm okay trusting that. Cool. Nice. Seeing there's no other questions, I'm going to leave it at that and we'll find a way to get you the slides. Um, and um, yeah, um, yeah, we'll get you slides. May even post them up on LinkedIn or something. I don't know. We'll figure out a way. There you go. Other thing. <laughs> cool. Thanks, thank you. Guys. Um, thanks, Matt, for presenting. That's all right. Recording is being stopped now. Oh.